It was also an interview format, so I wasn't even in the shot. It wasn't really a podcast yet. Right. But um, anyways, <laughs> yes. Yeah, Welcome. So, Thanks for yeah. coming. Thank you for um, taking the time and, and giving me the chance to yeah. uh, interview you, Emily. Awesome. Um, how do I pronounce your last name, by the way? It's such a cool name. Thank you. It's Kajian. Kajian. Mm-hmm. And that's Armenian? It is, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I um I kept my last name because it is to me very unique and also just part of my heritage and I don't like we've been so erased already that I'm like I can't just keep being erased so yeah that was important for me to keep it at that point yeah yeah definitely yeah I saw that you were you were also learning some some of your the language yes that's really cool yes keeping um, it alive. Uh, it's, yeah, and it is really hard. And I, um, I have a great teacher who I love, but, uh, I, it is, I don't even know how to describe like why it's so difficult, but it's like one of these things where I, every time I get to class, I'm like, oh my gosh, (laughs) like why is this so difficult? Mm -hmm. But I also, I so appreciate just having the the things that I have learned and reminding myself of how far I've come where I'm like, I could only say a couple of phrases and now I can say more and I can actually read and the like, it's a different alphabet. So I learned a whole new alphabet and now I can kind of read and write and, you know, Mm -hmm. so I, the familiarity of that at least is within me. Yeah. So I feel like it's, it's slowly coming to my brain. Because no, really my cool. grandparents used to speak it to me as when I was a kid. And my dad was fully fluent until he was five. And mm-hmm. it was all he spoke. And then once he got to school, he was like, oh, I'm not speaking this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. Mm-hmm. I'm, I want to be American. And his parents were like, ooh. Yeah. Um, but that unfortunately kind of got, you know, where I feel like, again, there's a generational difference between that melting pot idea of like oh we come to america and we we are american and it's like Mm -hmm. i don't i miss that you know i feel like that's so much of what i'm missing is that part of where i come from and yeah kind of tying back into the work and definitely you know yeah. yeah those are a lot of um the themes in your work it seems like the themes of your work overlap with your life your personal life so much Totally. Um, yeah, and I'm half Jewish as well, so it's like there's two, like two full, two genocides basically that happened in my back in the background, and I think right. I also really internalized a lot of that fear of of these groups of people that are trying to kill you, you know, mm-hmm. and then you have to hide as much as you can, like either hiding yourself by passing for as as white as possible or like whatever that is or not being ethnic or not being too ethnic or too Jewish or too Middle Eastern or whatever that is and that kind of struggle of like well then who am I because I'm not these people and I'm yeah. not those people and I'm not you know so it's mm-hmm. it really it really got as the more I understand about it the more I go oh that's that's where all this is coming from you know yeah yeah well on that note of of identity and and forming a sense of self going into like your background and your story you're originally from new jersey and new york city and you are a (laughs) multifaceted uh creative professional so you work in theater film you're essentially an actor you're i saw you on some television some music videos and you're also uh in the visual arts with painting and I saw some jewelry making and photography as yes. well. Yes. Um, so very multifaceted. Um, Octopus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah, I guess where we should start, I'm just curious, like how would you describe focusing in specifically on your, your paintings and, mm-hmm. and your art? Um, how would you describe it, like your style? I think I have... I mean, I, I'm right now I'm working mostly abstract and I think that the reason why I gravitate to that abstraction is, is it's a way to 
kind of describe a whole bunch of different feelings in one go where it's not like you're like I'm trying to do kind of a figure or something that people can kind of hold on to and go I know what that is or I understand what that is and Mm. I think having it be almost like an internal life like what does the internal life look like for for me and then how does that manifest on a canvas and I think um then that's why I think also planning I don't I don't always like to plan what I'm going to do. In fact, if I do plan too much, it backfires because I get too caught up in like, oh, well, it's supposed to look like this. And I'm like, mm, it doesn't need to look like that. Like, that's not interesting. Or, not interesting to me anymore. Mm-hmm. It was interesting before, but it's not interesting now. So it's an, so I think that um, there's a level of, I just enjoy playing with paint on canvas Mm -hmm. at the same time that I also enjoy just kind of the shapes and the colors and feeling those colors and and getting excited by just loving what I'm seeing too and that's kind of just the fun of of the process it seems like your style is kind of transformed Um, and I know it's kind of early but I actually think it would be cool when we're talking about this to talk about Um, And I'll be able to put this on the screen later, but just to show you how with some of your earlier figurative work, Mm -hmm. this is almost like mystical, this piece. I really liked how kind of dreamy and otherworldly it is and like kind of spiritual. And then it seems like gradually there's there's an introduction of these patterns. And then I see like some little, little patterns coming in. And then your work now is like entirely those that kind of abstract style it's the entire canvas exactly and it's like this total transformation and almost like a, as i look through your your journey of, of how your arts change it's like you broke through to this other realm almost where everything is abstract mm-hmm. um can you talk about i have my own ideas but can you talk about like what that was about for you yeah um, it's interesting because I was, I would take a lot of classes at School of Visual Arts. It's a school in Manhattan. When I got, after I graduated college, they had um, kind of a workshop class that you could take for a semester where you kind of come in and, and you have a teacher, but you're just kind of working. Like it gives you studio time, basically. So I had a studio to go to. And um, I was making a lot of abstract work then. So it was like, that was kind of like, oh, I think I'm going to, make you know like abstract seems to be where I want to point myself and that's where kind of I felt like I started my my inspiration was a lot of that Mm -hmm. and then but I was also working on this like other work and my teacher would come over and I would she'd be like what are you doing with that stuff and I was doing a lot of like sketchy uh, marker pieces that were like a little bit like Basquiat inspired of like these female figures with like eye weird eyeballs and like you know just like writing yeah and I was and she was like what's up with your secret work like what's happening under here like why are you hiding it like what's the deal with that and so Mm -hmm. that's kind of where it became like oh well maybe my secret work is what I need to be working on right now um and that's where it became just all about like kind of working out this this figure and what that figure meant and not really understanding myself what it meant until much later I think because Mm -hmm. I started doing more work on like what what's it like to have a narcissistic parent and like how does that affect you and how does that affect your choices in life and how did you feel powerless and why and all these characters are basically like powerless people within the world or like there's a bunch of large ladies and then there's one little one you know and it's like Mm -hmm. oh that's just me (laughs) Yeah. in my family <laughs> yeah so it when it became that kind of like obvious um story I was like oh this is interesting okay and then when I would put a lot of writing in the work so there was there's some paintings where it's literally the whole background is just writing mm-hmm. and uh it was a lot of stream of consciousness and it was a lot of just like diary writing and journal writing was not meant to be read and people would come up to it and be like can I read this and I'd be like no please don't <laughs> <laughs> I know I put yeah. it there but don't read it um and 
uh, the thing that kind of broke everything apart and then made well, kind of was the rebirth, unfortunately, was fortunately and unfortunately was the the figure that my mother had been changed because she got dementia. So she started her kind of journey of dementia probably about 10 years ago, 10 mm-hmm. or 11 years ago. Okay. And the when that happened, she was unable to be as controlling and as kind of like uh just everywhere so it kind of was it 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 enabled me to break free and be like okay i don't need to make i don't need to tell that story anymore Mm -hmm. but what story am i telling like what am i doing and then it was kind of like this like exactly what you said like that's when those paintings started becoming the figures started getting smaller and i was like "Ooh, i really like this part yeah. I really love the dress, or I'm obsessed about the dress and making the patterns of this dress, but I don't know if I care about anything else, you know, mm-hmm. like, um, and like slowly I was like, I think I can let go of this now. Mm. I think I can really let go of this character and just have like enjoy the patterns, you know, and yeah. like, what does that mean? And how does that manifest itself and whatever? And then, yeah. um, uh, Yeah, it's funny how, like, you can ask a question, and I will keep talking, and then I'm like, I don't remember what the question was, but I hope I just answered it. No, you totally did, yeah. (laughs) I'm like, what am I talking about again? The themes, yeah, no, the themes, that was actually, I mean, I I alluded to earlier, I had my own ideas, and Mm. I'm I'm happy to hear that it kind of mapped on to what you were saying, which was, like, a big theme of some of your early figurative... Um, kind of work, the secret works as your art teacher described them um, are like are like that, which is like your own personal life and kind of uh, another artist, uh, Ronnie Giannotti, who I had early on the mm-hmm. show talks about how like his paintings are therapeutic for him and it helps him process things in his own life. Exactly. Um, and so that being a major theme and then And it's sometimes a little disappointing because you're like, oh, is that all I was doing? It was just it's like, like therapy. <laughs> mm-hmm. well, no, I think it's valuable. I think it's, <laughs> yes. I think, and I think it's cool because then people, um, other people, like you were saying, can look at that art and and um, either they'll just appreciate it or they'll actually kind of resonate with it and be like, okay, like I get, I really feel like I I know this. Yeah. I mean, um, that was really the, I think the biggest, like having. Starting to do open studios in New York and in Brooklyn, I had a studio in Dumbo, and um, this was before Dumbo is now. Dumbo is like a real neighborhood now. Like back mm-hmm. in the back in the day, it was like I had to bring my own. Like we had to bring potable water. Like there was no water in the building. There was no. It was a cold water. Whatever you you couldn't drink it. You oh, wow. there was nothing there. There was a deli that had like was a front for something else because they were, I don't know what they were. There was like oh, never anything <laughs> okay. in there. Yeah. So it was there that like I would, I had my first open studio and that's where I sold my first works. And this was like, you know, 97, um, 98. And, uh, and this woman walked in and she was like, I, I need that piece. That is exactly how I feel. And, and yeah. it was like, can I swear? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not like PBS. Yeah. Um, but it was basically a picture of like a, a portrait of this, of a, one of my female figures in marker. And it just mm-hmm. said, fuck off at the bottom. And it was like, she was just like, this is my, yeah. this is my people. This is my, you're my people. Uh-huh. And I was like, yay. I love, like, I just love that moment of like, and this is the connection I've made. And then as people, as I kept having open studios and people would come through Mm-hmm. talk to me about how they felt and they would tell me stories about their lives or this reminds me of this time that happened to me and this this is how I feel when I look at your work and it would just be awesome like I was like this is the whole point you know like yeah. hey and um and then of course there were the people who were like oh it's so whimsical and I'd be like that's that's awesome too like I'm yeah. glad you see that but I and I never wanted to be like, it's really painful. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to put that on other people either. So True. it was an interesting kind of balance of, yeah. 
and and your art now the way that it's with abstract painting it's 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 harder to kind of know what um an artist is going for in terms of like if they were to have to put it into words the mm -hmm. theme is there a theme of your more abstract stuff that you're doing now that you're really exploring yeah i think it's mostly to do with um just rootlessness feeling like i have no place in the world and like having no nowhere in the world that i feel comfortable where i feel like i belong and i think that's what it, what i'm exploring within kind of like those internal feelings that go on within the body where you're just like i don't you know it's like a ch constant churning where you're like i don't know yeah. you know like the 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 bubbles never settle like nothing ever like just kind of goes and flattens out um mm -hmm. so i think that that's and a lot like i mean people see kind of like and even like there's a painting that you picked out i think somebody said it looked like brain scans like the like the um the, the wheel one this one, this one. yeah yeah like a br almost like a like some some kind of scientific technical word about like how you you know see brain scans and like people's like you know how people's brains light up in different ways and interesting yeah i could see that so i thought that was really interesting but i've definitely told people that and you know just about the rootlessness and feeling like i'm like a loss or whatever and right i don't i feel like it kind of makes people sad you know this one woman was like well now i feel sad when I look at your work, and I was like, "You don't have to. I just, yeah. you know, it's just like whatever." So then I'm like, "I just need to be quiet." Yeah. <laughs> but I, I do. Um, it is really satisfying to look at the work and and see kind of something that I like. Like I'm like, oh, I really, I enjoy looking at that piece of art, and I think mm -hmm. even that, like, just that that kind of like well what do i want to look at you know right yeah i could understand how someone could see that how colorful it is and and just associate it with like playful creative exploration yeah. but at the same time it does um it does kind of remind me of like a sense of like you're saying like inf infinity almost mm. like how there's that. there's a. Uh, no not to like get too uh too out there but like I love it the center of like a, a cell or whatever or like the center of like an atom is like mostly yeah. empty space and like the universe is empty space and i just look at this and i kind of see i get that feeling of like empty spaceness mm. and so i see the connection yeah. you're talking about with feeling uprooted from like your homeland and then not really feeling like you really connect or feel at home anywhere in the world yeah. And I think that's even more highlighted in your life story because it's, I think that's a common struggle that everyone kind of deals with, mm. but with you, it's even more highlighted yeah. because of your, your, um, ethnic history and, yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. And it's interesting because a friend of mine got married in Israel, oh my gosh, probably like 12 years ago, 12 or 13 years ago. Mm. Yeah, to, it, no, it must have been 12. My son was... Anyway. Um, and going there, I had never... I, I went to Israel and, you know, I had never been to the Middle East. And I was like, oh, this is what it's like when you're around people that all look like you and they all sound like you and they all mm. think you're related to them and they all are like trying to speak to you in whatever language they speak because you look like you belong there yeah and i was like <laughs> i had no idea there was a place where yeah. i felt where i belong you know so that's i think where also part of the journey of like oh that's the discomfort that i'm feeling that's what it feels like when i'm around the people that i'm kind of like that i look like and not that it's like i love being around diverse diversity and people and different kinds of people mm -hmm. um and that's what I love about New York and I love about Oakland and, you know, just that kind of whatever. But I think there is that level where you're like, oh, my gosh, there are people who do look like me or sound like me or whatever or come mm -hmm. from the place. And I, I'm so glad I know where they are now. <laughs> yeah, sure. 
Yeah. Um, growing up in New York, what was that like for you? You were in a, a great place to be a creative professional growing up. Um, mm. You know, that's a real uh, cool thing to have. Can you talk about that experience of, of growing up in a, in a diverse place with a lot of creative professionals around you, artists, yeah. actors, musicians? What was um, that like? Yeah, I, uh, as a kid, we would go into New York City a lot. My, my dad's family lived in Queens. My mom's family was in Brooklyn. So my grandparents were there. And then my parents had this incredibly like amazing group of friends that were artists and uh, professors and writers and just intellectual people. So we would mm-hmm. we were in we would go to New York all the time. And um, my mom's best friend was a painter, and so we would go to like and in like the fifties and sixties and seventies, like you could be a <laughs> you could be a teacher. You could be an mm-hmm. artist, sorry. You could be a painter and and a professor and mm-hmm. have an apartment and in Manhattan with mm-hmm. a studio and with uh-huh. enough space to have a family. And then you so you teach. So all these people that we knew taught during the year at all the universities, mm-hmm. and then um, would go up to Maine for the summer to their summer homes because they could also afford summer homes because mm-hmm. the economy was better, and. They could, they would paint all summer and then we would go up and visit them. And so it would be like this open studio event of the summer. So you would yeah. go, they would paint all summer and then at the end they would open up their studio. So we would go around um, and see all the work that they had done and all the, um, just the, the, and talk to people about their process and hear how their summer went and everything. So that was like a huge part and just kind of being involved in the gallery spaces and going mm-hmm. there as a kid and also going to see theater. We saw a ton of theater. My dad is a Shakespeare. He was a scholar and a professor of Shakespeare. So oh, I was wow. seeing okay. theater from when I was like five years old. You know. So he, both your parents were, were in the artistic, because I know your mother was an artist, yeah. but your father also was mm-hmm. involved was, in the performing exactly. arts. Yeah, well, he was, an, he was, he was a writer and she was a writer and a poet, and um, he also studied Shakespeare and taught Shakespeare, but he wasn't an actor. She okay. was an actor. She okay. was an actor in New York, in, and from like probably when she was about 13 to about 25. And then oh, wow. she okay. like left and had kids. Mm-hmm. And kind of, you know, whatever. She was sad about that. But um, yeah, there it's so there was just a lot. There was so much to be <laughs> the cat. Um, there was so much going on and so much around me, but it was also like it's a really intimidating place to be yeah. as well. So you're yeah. like, okay, here I am with the best of the best. Like you do not move to New York unless you are like like unless you're the best. And then mm-hmm. you they can chew up and spit you out. And I think I got um I was so I again like my identity was so caught up in kind of family and not having a lot of choice of like what I was allowed to do or what I was allowed to pursue because although my mother was an actor and was a writer and enjoyed the arts and loved art and Mm -hmm. encouraged us to love art Mm -hmm. she was like you're not allowed to go to acting school and you're not allowed to go to art school and I'm not paying for it if you go and so it was like okay well I guess I'll be an English major yeah but I like to read, you mm-hmm. know, but then what do you, you know, like that's, you know, I, and then you kind of get, you know, so I was all over the place and I couldn't, and I think that's why, like, I always say, like, I'm just, I was, I was a mess. Like I, <laughs> I was mm-hmm. a mess. I'm still a mess, but I was really a mess. Like I really could not settle into like who I was and what I wanted. And I couldn't even answer the question of like, what do I want? What, am mm. I, what do I want? You know, it was yeah. always like, well, what does she think I should do? Or what does she think I should say? Or how does she want me to be? And I think that's what kind of like drove me into like the punk rock scene of mm. like New Jersey and New York. And I think that's, it was kind of like, well, if I'm, if I can't follow her rules, I'll just do follow these people's rules. Mm-hmm. And 
and punk rock for being punk rock or whatever it is, it, it's a very rule oriented place, which I think is funny because you think, oh, it's anarchy, but it, there's a lot of rules to follow where it's like, oh, if you, do, you have to dress this way and you have to listen to this kind of music and these people are punk, but these people aren't punk because they, you know, like Green Day just come out and they were like, well, they're, they're, yeah. they're too commercial. And you're like, I kind of like them. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're like, but, yeah. you know, I'm not supposed to like them, so I won't like them. And rah, you know. Yeah. Um, so there was that, there was a, that kind of was a huge scene that, that drew me in and really kind of, I was trying to separate myself from my mom in that way as well, where I was mm. like, well, I'll just do this then. And that's yeah. not really a person, it's not really doing anything for you. You know, like I love the music and I loved the, the culture and the people and the shows and going to see, you know, like there were so many great music venues to go to in New York City, like mm -hmm. old and like basements of whatever, like a place called ABC No Rio, where it was just like, like, you know, I don't, very dangerous. Like, you yeah. know, <laughs> like somebody was going to die and I'm sure they did. <laughs> at, at that time when you were, you were, um, kind of in high schoolish, maybe going into college, uh, were there any inspirational figures in the punk rock movement or otherwise that really kind of, uh, helped, helped you? Cause I feel like role models are, are essential for, for any artist in, in kind of talking doing what you're describing which is kind of like forging this identity yeah. in like the college to 20 30 years yeah i think right um change. i was really uh there were a couple bands that i was like i really love like uh, x was one of the bands which is where my my website comes from so devil doll is, devil a, doll. is an x right. song mm -hmm. and xine Cervenko was a really cool she was just like Cool. You know what I mean? What like was her name? Xine Cervenka. Xine Cervenka. She's she a was singer. A, she was the lead singer of X with this guy, John Doe. And um, and that was a really, like, I was like, oh, you know, it's just like, just be free and, and sing crazy songs and write poetry and make art and do whatever you want to do. Like, do it how you want to do it. Like, it's just mm -hmm. like, do, if you can't go to school, then do it yourself or figure out how to make it work. Yeah. And then, like, artists like PJ Harvey and, um, you know, all, like, Bikini Kill and all those bands where it was just, like, raw women bah, screaming. Yeah. And, but also just, like, these really, like, intense, like, crass and um, Dead Kennedys and, uh, you know, people, like, people who were making music bad religion like uh, like music about politics and like doing forging your own way basically and i think that's where i was like well i have to figure out how to forge my own way somehow because i can't keep doing this but i just didn't know how to separate myself at all mm -hmm. but it, it, it's a little like and i think artistically i i knew i wanted to be kind of like the artists that my parents knew growing up too because they they made really interesting expressionistic paintings mm. a lot of them were you know you know slightly impressionistic as well like my mom was a real she was huge into the impressionists and whatever but um but there was a, a level of of emotion within those paintings that i knew i wanted to to remember and and like hold on to as well mm -hmm. but i was really a pinball like all over the place. Like I mm -hmm. could not, and I was like, I really want to be an actor as well. Like, how yeah. do I do that? How do I do that? You know, and I would be yeah. like, I want to try, but then I would be like, well, oh, I don't know what I'm doing, um, but I'm going to try anyway. You know, mm -hmm. People would be like, you can do it anyway. You can do whatever you want. You know, yeah. there's that kind of like, <laughs> you know, and you're like, well, I know, but people go to school for it. Yeah. Um, but all of that to say that I think, um, you know, there was a, there was a lot of, there was a lot of heavy drinking. I, you know, I started drinking from a very young age and, like, was very, like, you know, and experimenting with drugs and doing um, just the things that made me feel other things. So I was like, mm -hmm. I can, I, you know, wow, like, and I think alcohol was a real, uh, it was a, it was a crutch for a really long time. I've been sober now for 
six years and oh, wow. it's made a huge difference congratulations thank you that's awesome thank you um yeah it was a it was a it's yeah i loved it <laughs> Mm-hmm. It did not serve me. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I yeah, and I I feel like I have I have learned so much about myself by doing self, my self work or like my own kind of therapy or like my own, you know, like I've had therapy in the past, but like, I think a lot of, I do a lot of reading and I do a lot of kind of like self reflection to kind of understand what, what happened. You yeah. Know? Mm-hmm. Cause I get, I'm very envious of people who were kind of like at 16, I knew I wanted to be an, an artist or I knew I wanted to be an actor. So then I knew I needed to go do X, Y, and Z to get there. And then I did mm-hmm. all those things. And now I am an actor. And you're like, wow, yeah. <laughs> that's cool. Because yeah. I don't understand that at all. Yeah. Um, and that's so part of our culture. And I feel like that's what people want to hear. They want to hear like, oh, where'd you go to school? How'd you get whatever you know and did you follow all the rules to get to the place to this place and i'm like mm-hmm. no I yeah i don't follow any rules and, yeah and you're making me uncomfortable yeah <laughs> i feel like confidence is is a thing that even if it kind of just has to be faked in oh the my moment God. in the moment and and then we kind of spin narratives of ourselves that make it seem like yeah i did that thing because i was going to arrive at where I'm at now but really it's just like no they were just kind of improvising exactly Um, and I'm really bad at that story too like I know I probably should come up with a different story where I'm like I knew exactly what I was doing but I'm mm. like I didn't know what the fuck I was doing yeah and here I am and I'm still like I still feel like I'm like like open mouth (laughs) every Mm. day like what's happening today like what am I doing today and you know finding you know like even my husband and I are very different people. Like he'll be like, "What are you doing today?" And I'll be like, "I have no idea. I have I have a list mm-hmm. that I wrote down, but I don't have it's on my head." Yeah. And I don't I have to look at the calendar. <laughs> have Have you encountered like a I mean, I know you have encountered a lot of of creative people, actors and musicians and artists. Amongst them, like how would you break it down? Like what what percentage of them have kind of what you're talking about where it's like they seem very grounded in their in their journey of of where they're at now and how they how they got there versus people who kind of improvised and stumbled their way into their current mm. role. Mm. That's a great question. I I think I'm more attracted to the people that have that are more like me. So in other mm. words, like people I know personally are more like they're like, "Oh, we just stumbled through and figured it out." Mm-hmm. And bah, you know, yeah. like I feel like my two best friends are like that too. Like, we're just like, Whoa, you know, and we'll, you know, get, because it's, but then I feel like as I've taken on different kind of parts of my personality where I became a mom and met lots of people doing, like, as mothers who were like mm-hmm. way different from me, like so different. And yeah. I'm like, wow, you guys, wow, you're so normal. Yeah. <laughs> What's that like? Yeah. Like, oh, you knew kind of like, like, I just, I'm also just kind of in awe of people. Like, I'm like, what, like, what's it like to like have parents who are just nice people, like normal, like you just have a normal. What do you mean by that? Normal, (laughs) like structured and very rational thinking and just kind of like, I have this, this, this to do. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think I, I don't know if I, it's, it's not like, oh, I wish I was normal, but I wish but I, I definitely put that on a pedestal where I'm like, mm. neato, like, yeah. oh, that's cool. And, or, and so, and, but then when I start meeting people in those worlds where it's like, mo- like moms who are like, I, they are really good at what they do. They mm-hmm. have regular jobs. They're not artists. Um, I am like, wow, that is, it's super cool. Like, it's cool to meet people who actually like, like went go through the world and they know 
where they want to go. You know what I mean? Like they're like, oh, and here's like, here's what I did here. And I did this because of this. And like, then I went here and I did that because I wanted to get to the next level of here. And now I'm here. And you're like, cool. Yeah. Um, And so I think that's a great perspective to have. And then I feel like when I meet, um, like I'm in an acting group that's based in LA. So a lot of Mm -hmm. those people are, you know, grounded in like, they went to school, they did grad school, some of them, and they're really good at what they do. And they're Mm -hmm. really, it's really fun to watch that process and be like, oh yeah, that's because you did all the steps to go to get to this place where you're not, you're not like, you weren't like bing, 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 you know, you know? Yeah. And you have, you know, there's a, there's something so earnest about that that I really wish I had. And there's an earnestness of people that I'm like, wow, that's, I'm so, um, I don't know if that's from, maybe it's from being in New York, but I'm just like, this is, this, I don't know, I'm all over the place. Yeah. Well, I think there's tons of examples of, of creatives who are all over the place yeah. and, <laughs> and doing just fine. I, but I think it's more of a, of a, yeah, maybe like a personality tendency. Um, but I could understand. I'm I'm also kind of like that. And so I can, I can be envious of people who are, 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 like you're saying, more structured and kind of more rational. Yeah. Um, but rationality and art don't usually always go together, at least not on the creative side, maybe like on the business marketing side. Yeah. But I've just through doing this podcast, had conversations with a couple artists who are just like they they would look at your art which is abstract and they would go genuinely i've had at least two conversations like this people who are more realist Mm -hmm. and they're like i wish i could tap into something more abstract i've tried Mm -hmm. and i just can't i have Mm -hmm. to just like be i just have to copy not copy but represent reality as it is and it's very hard to um to kind of deviate from that mm. so i think it's it's a, like a give and take you know strengths That's and weaknesses but um i like hearing that because i'm like yeah i couldn't even imagine like i love i love hearing i like i like hearing that because i feel like because mm. you just have to remind yourself like not everybody is like you yeah and you're a unique person and yeah. everybody's a unique person yeah. and um being other people doesn't mean it's better Mm -hmm. yeah on that kind of note of of creativity and like that that whole um process like can you walk me through your your brainstorming process like how you get ideas like where with the work you're doing now which is so abstract like how do you even start Mm -hmm. yeah well i have like i work from photographs actually a lot of the time so i'll do um okay yeah yeah totally um i should have had this more organized um i like to take i like to kind of like walk around i'm sorry hello microphone i like to kind of walk around and um look at plants and like look at like i don't know like weird angles of things right so you're good mm-hmm. like or you stick your camera inside something and get a a sense of something on a micro level or even like a macro level where it's like yeah oh here's like the inside of a tree but that could also be the inside of your brain or it can be the inside of your lungs or it could be yeah. you know I don't and I think that's where I kind of go ah like I I'm so fascinated by those by these things and so I make like I make these little books of like things that I find and some of them are my photographs and some like this is a quilt mm-hmm. um, like abstract quilt from like the Guise Bend um there was a show at the De Young of the um, of their quilts, like I don't know, a long time ago, probably twelve or thirteen years ago. Mm-hmm. But these women were making basically abstract paintings yeah. using, uh, you know, fabric, which fabric, I love. Yeah, and and then or just like finding weird 
things on the, you know, like finding things like this where I just have to go, okay, well, let's just get lost in this. And what does that translate onto a canvas? And then um, there's another group of people on like Facebook or even on Instagram where they do, um, they call it involuntary painting. And so they take photographs of like walls that have been like painted on and then painted again and then like or they're trying to cover graffiti or whatever and then it ends mm -hmm. up looking like a Rothko almost and you're and then people will walk by and be like well that looks like a piece of art and yeah. take a photograph of it and then post it online mm -hmm. and so I've been really inspired by that kind of thing where I've I've even like like that blue um there's a blue painting that's actually I, I have in a show that's opening this weekend and that painting is based on a crack in blue paint on the wall that somebody took a photograph of. It's literally just cracked paint. Yeah. Um, and I love that. I don't know. It's like mistakes mm -hmm. and, uh, or like the beauty and like finding something as you're walking around. And if you're really noticing, you'll see art everywhere, you know? Yeah. And, and if you want to, if you want to see it, you'll find it. And I, that's like kind of like my philosophy of like, you know, yeah. Like, make sure you're looking around. Don't just like. I don't know. Like, if you if you. Like even like these leaves. Like what? Yeah. <laughs> and then you can flip it, turn it, and reorient it for different <laughs> things. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that reminds totally. me. It's funny because I have a children's book that I um. I grew up. I loved it as a kid, and I found it, and then I lost it again, but. It was called Picasso, and it was about a cat Okay. that leaves the farm. He lives, he's a farm cat, mm -hmm. lives in a barn, and he's moving to the city to become an artist. So everyone's like, bye, Picasso, like, enjoy your time in the city. He moves to the city, gets a big apartment, he gets all these canvases, and he starts painting all these paintings. Mm -hmm. And then he opens up his studio, and he's like, I'm having a show, and everybody comes through the show, and then there's, of course, one reviewer who comes, and he's like, these paintings are terrible. Mm -hmm. I think you should stop painting right now and never paint again. And everyone's like, yeah. yeah. And they all leave. And he's sad. So mm -hmm. He's sitting in a studio and he's like, I'm super sad about this. This is terrible. Like, I guess I'm going to move back to the farm and give up and whatever. And he's sitting on the floor. He's depressed. And he's, he's on like a pillow. And he, he's sitting upside down. And he's looking at his paintings. And he, he goes, oh, they actually look kind of good upside down. And then he turns all his paintings around. Uh -huh. So the little <laughs> illustrations are like the cats, you know, turning all the paintings around. And then he invites everybody back in and invites the reviewer. Yeah. The reviewer is like, these are amazing paintings. Yeah. Why didn't you show us these before? Mm -hmm. And and then he's like, you get a, you know, gold star for whatever. Congratulations. You're number one, number one artist. Mm -hmm. And I always think about that book. I, You know, it's got to be 40 or 50 years old. And, and I think, yeah, that's just like, like, that's kind of the philosophy of life. Like one person can tell you that the same artwork is terrible. That is also good. Right. <laughs> turn yeah. it around. So. Yeah. That's really art. Yeah. yeah. And especially yeah. nowadays, I look at some of like the, the mainstream famous artists and I, it's like, well, that's really cool. And, but it's no, like it's different because it's art and each piece is different exactly. but like uh yeah i totally know what you mean but it's not like oh my god this is so much better like yeah you know, it's not like than, objectively better than yeah than like why uh, is that worth 10 million dollars and this worth you know whatever i don't know yeah yeah it's, do you have any strong opinions on on manufactured art like art that involves like lots of assistance or like <laughs> uh, like uh jeff coons Jeff Koons also, he yeah, he he's mm -hmm. like using like a factory, I imagine, to create some oh. of his poodle balloon yeah. things. Like, um, I um, I don't. I think it's if you need somebody to help you make your art, then why not do that? Like, you don't have like I kind of feel like there is, and I I think my answer is different than it would be than it would have been a couple like. 20 years ago I think I would have been like fuck those people you should be able to make with your hands and if you don't make it with your hands then fuck it yeah. um, but I feel different I think that um, especially I just saw the Kahinde Wiley exhibit at um, the De Young. have you seen it? I haven't no 
Uh, it's absolutely like phenomenal and like How it long just is it going brings for? down your house. Like it brings down the house. Like it is phenomenal. Um, mm. It's up, I think, for the summer. It's up for a while. Oh, okay. Um, cool. But his these paintings are fucking huge. Like mm. they are the size of this, like of that wall. Like they're enormous. And, oh wow. Like, you know, he has a team of people that help him paint his paintings, mm-hmm. you know. And I yeah. and I, I think uh, if that's what you, you know, and like somebody was like, you know, yeah, of course, they're huge. Like he couldn't paint yeah. this many <laughs> paintings big, yeah, in that much time. Yeah. And he has the, now he has the kind of like the clout and the, and the money and, the, and all that to be able to afford it. So mm-hmm. for him, that works. I think for me, like, it's just, I couldn't imagine that personally, because that's not, I'm not making, my work is, feels very personal. I'm not, like, Mm -hmm. creating something. Like, I'm, like, I hope it sits in somebody's living room. I'm not, like, oh, I hope I'm going to be in a museum one day. Do you know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. I hope somebody loves it enough that they want it in their house. Yeah. But do I think I'm going to be in a museum? No. You know, that's, Yeah. Yeah. So I think it depends. I think there's different art for different things. And I think especially, you know, there are certain people who really want that museum, Mm -hmm. whatever thing. And they're like, I'm going to make a giant poodle. And I want it to be, whatever. Yeah. I get whatever. (laughs) So, you know, or a shark in a tank. What do you mean by you know, that? Um, Shark in a tank. The, the what's his name? I'm I'm forgetting his name. Um, Damien Hurst. Oh yeah. You know, he just. Oh right, yeah. The uh, formaldehyde. Yeah. Works. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th- they're almost. I almost kind of get the urge to like categorize artists. There are mm. some who who get the most gratification from just having their idea, material like materialize, and then. There are other artists that yeah. really enjoy the process, the, the state of flow they can get into of like just being in the studio for hours at a time, yeah. just like doing little details. And yeah. it's like different breeds of artists. Yeah. Um, That's a great way of putting it, yeah. Because the the, peop- the artists that are manufacturing, they're not really, they're not ha- they're having little to no like of that kind of flow state. I would imagine a lot of it would be, I conceptualizing in their head yeah. but there's no like nitty-gritty kind of focusing in the same way that like you might with your your paintings here exactly yeah i think that's um, a really good distinction because i think and i'm not saying one is better than the other it's just also i think different people need different things too like i think art does help people in th- like th- kind of therapeutically go through what they need to go through in order to like succeed and then for other people, it's like they want to make a piece of art that sits in a in or somewhere else, or they want to make they want someone else to do it, which I think mm-hmm. is totally valid too. If that's your personality too, I think that's like again, like it's a it's almost like a confidence thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, could I imagine telling people what to do? No. <laughs> I can barely tell my kids what to do <laughs> so your your creative process i think it's cool that you're open about um yeah your um relationship with with alcohol and, and mm-hmm. other drugs and stuff like that because i i think that i think that's just i'm an, i'm also a very open person i mm-hmm. think it's really it's always cool to hear people's stories because it kind of helps with cultivating like this sense of common humanity amongst yeah. everyone with with those kind of things because it's yeah. such a a strong issue to I mean it's been an issue for so long but like the idea of like addiction or just like having thing vices things like that um, and sorry I'm getting sidetracked with that but like the reason I bring that up is because um, going back to like creative process stuff there are things that artists will use as like supports like supportive tools to help them be more creative mm. and like um, Jackson Pollock and alcohol come yeah. to mind or something mm-hmm. like that and then there are also other more sus- like sustainable ish like things like music like in your on your bio on your website you mentioned how you like to listen to music uh, Tame Impala, Tycho, Alt J which I listen to I haven't heard of Boards of Canada yeah. I'll have to check them out yeah. but um, 
yeah for your creative process when you're making art and stuff like um are there any supportive tools that you use to this day that are kind of like really helpful for you yeah i um music is definitely a huge one i think um and i feel like i so appreciate things like pandora where i feel like i am so like i I get bored listening to the same music over and over again. Like I want to hear new stuff and I want to hear new artists and, um, and be reminded of, of kind of like, I, you know, I'm in awe of musicians too. Cause I just feel like, God, I can't even believe people like are still, like we can still make new music and hear this music and, um, and create it. And I, mm-hmm. you know, and I do, I use music. Um, I do listen to a lot of podcasts. Oh, you do? Yeah. Oh, cool. And like, like weird ones, like true crime, you know, or like oh, yeah. whatever, you know what I mean? Or like something that just kind of makes my brain not think too much, but like where I can kind of go, like I'm listening to this voice or I'm listening to this story, but it's not mm-hmm. so intrusive that like I can't focus on like what I'm doing. Because a lot of times I am just making, you know, like I'm just, I'm like, I have to f- kind of fill something in. Where it's not like, I'm like, what am I doing right now? It's like, I just need to fill this in, yeah. you know, and like work out where these colors go. And I can think, I can listen to a podcast and also, you know, fill this in at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, uh, I, I do really love, um, that flow state and I just feel like that is really it's a super special thing to experience where you're just like I am so like I am just working right now you know what I mean like it's just like I don't Mm -hmm. but I also have been able to harness that to just by because I used to be very much like I'm going to the studio and I'm going to be at the studio for three hours and I'm going to do three hours of work and I'm leaving Mm. and then I won't be back for another week and um and it's really hard to get in and out of a flow state if you're like, I have to be here right now. And, and mm-hmm. then you'd be like, okay, well, I don't, I don't want to be there. And you're like, well, you have to because you have no other choice. Like yeah. you're a mom and this is, this is you have a babysitter and you've got to be back and you've got to make it work. So yeah. I think that kind of like stuffing yourself into something where you're like, I feel uncomfortable and you're like, do it anyway. is like, it's a really important way to kind of like get yourself to just work through the voices in your head to be like just work like mm-hmm. just work and it's funny because you mentioned Pollock and um, there's a scene in the movie Pollock where Marsha Gay Harden is playing um, Lee Krasner mm-hmm. and he's doing something stupid like being drunk and whatever and she's she screams at him just paint just paint yeah and that literally <laughs> plays in my head all the time like i am constantly like like if i'm ever like mm-hmm, and then i hear marcia k harden go as lee krasner going just paint yeah. i'm like okay i'll just paint yeah okay, okay you're right you're right so i feel like there's this like real push and pull of just like the the beauty of learning how to harness your own creativity and like even now having the studio here where it's off the kitchen Mm -hmm. and like I can come in here and I can get 10 minutes of work done and be like okay that's that I got 10 minutes done I can come back in and you know like I don't I'm not you know like I don't want even like barely wash my brushes like I'm just like whatever I need to do to make things to take away all the things that are making it hard for me to keep working like Mm. is it something I obsess over is it because my brushes are dirty like that's why I worry I don't want to like fuck the brushes you can buy new brushes or whatever it is you know Mm -hmm. just keep working and i think that's been the thing that has really tried you know like that kind of drive of like keep working keep working keep working and then harnessing my own weird weirdness i guess because i don't Mm -hmm. i don't i can't smoke pot i hate it it doesn't do anything for me Mm -hmm. and uh, the drugs that i like are really bad for you (laughs) yeah um do you use caffeine at all I drink caffeine, but not a ton because it not makes me too nervous. And mm. then, I had some before I came, and yeah. it also amplified my nervousness a bit. Yeah. But I drink coffee every day, and then I drink some tea. Okay. And then, yeah. But, like, I am real. Like, I, 
I was kind of like, oh, maybe I should try. Like, I'm kind of fascinated by like microdosing of mushrooms when I'm like old, like because mm-hmm. I don't want to be like a grumpy old person or like if I'm like infirm, like just I don't know, give me something that makes me happy. Yeah. <laughs> Let me yeah. go. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I do not like messing with, especially knowing so many people that have, that are gone through dementia or in, in the stages of dementia. It is such an awful thing to watch. Mm. And I'm like, I got to keep this brain intact. Like, I don't mm. want to do anything to like change yeah. that or, or alter that because it's so terrifying. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 So it almost sounds like with you, the supports for your creative process are almost like a, a, a stripping away of the things that are getting in the way and just like creating that time, even if it's just like 10 minutes exactly. in between dropping the kids off and needing to do something else or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I learned a lot during COVID too, of just like, can't go anywhere. You have to sit and you have to make something today. And mm-hmm. whatever it is, like you have no choice, you can't go anywhere. So I went out and like, I would collect three rocks every day, three stones, and I would paint three rocks every single day. And I saw that first, on your like, Instagram. Yeah, <laughs> three months of like, cool. Um, yeah, and they're not like art or like any, you know, like I'm not like, oh, I'm gonna sell these rocks. It was just like, mm. just this is the thing that's going to help you feel like you have some control and that you have like whatever. Yeah. We don't know what's happening. We don't know what this thing is. Kids are home. Uh, there's huge fires. Like, you know, mm-hmm. all those things were happening all at once. There's an orange yeah. day, you know, boys, oh, yeah. you know, it was yeah, like yeah. insane, but also like just coming up with those ways to help you maintain your practice and keep working. And I think that's, more important than like how do I make it work you know like how do I make it happen it's like we just have to do it Mm -hmm. you know yeah yeah that's kind of uh, uh, like the same thing that your friend Victoria was saying Mm, Um, love that yeah I think that's that's really the the way discipline yeah and just doing it even with the resistance that's there yeah um I want to go back to like the the transition between like like this like so these works um was this a was this a clean this is like a really specific question but i just had to ask is this a clean break that was kind of conscious when you went from these to this stuff here like this style Mm. was it like a conscious like okay i'm going into a new style um because it's kind of unclear from your website um, because of the year range is so long it's like Mm -hmm. 20 years if that was a slow transition or if it was a quick conscious one where it's like i'm switching now um i think i was like even this painting up here see how it's like it go it's getting into like the background is becoming a little more um kind of uh, like in the front and even like there's another one in there where I think those two were really like I was making decisions about like also um and this sounds like it sounds so funny but like I um always had a really hard time spending money on canvas because I felt like I didn't know how to it's so expensive and you buy one canvas and a canvas this size can be like 150 dollars Okay. And I'm like, I can't spend $150 on a canvas. And then, you know, like, that's insane. Mm-hmm. So I think there was, there's, which is, again, like, there are things that are barriers in your head. Where you're like, that is not a barrier. You make yeah. art however you make art, like, with whatever you want. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was doing a lot of, like, finding, like, doors on the side of the, like, or, like, I would pick up canvases off the sidewalk. Or I would be like, if, if I find the canvas on the sidewalk, then I can have a canvas. And so that mm. was where my brain was doing like weird stuff. Interesting. Yeah. Um, but I was like, but I can find all this stuff on, on the streets. And you can, um, but then you can have some control too. Um, so I bought, so I was like, I'm going to buy, I, I think I made a conscious decision. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to buy a couple of canvases. Mm. And then I'm going to like, you know, 
I'm not going to stretch them myself. I'm going to buy them because it, you know, it just saves that much more time because of my mom and I'm busy and whatever, blah, blah, blah. And then, um, because I would buy like raw canvas and roll it out on the floor and paint, oh, yeah. you know, and then like roll it back up. So I have rolls of, you know, paintings in, in, a, in a, like basically a storage area. But, um, but then I, I bought, I went to East Bay. <laughs> There's a East Bay Depot of Creative Reuse. Do you know that place? No. That sounds really cool. It's in awesome. Berkeley? It's in Oakland and it's on telegraph and it's just like okay. it's basically like people dump all their like any creative stuff that they want to get rid of mm -hmm. fabric scraps frames paper paint uh it's like a kind of a thrift story thing and i'm okay. huge into like thrift stores and thrifting and clothing thrifting all that stuff so yeah it all goes in it. anyway i went into there they had a huge canvas it was this size and they were selling it for 40 dollars. and i was like oh wow yes <laughs> and it fit in my car and I was like I'm excited and it sat in this garage for like a year and a half and I was like what the fuck am I going to do with this huge canvas like this is mm -hmm. like you know this is a big step for me to like take up this much space like yeah. I was working sort of big but like you know you it was like two feet by four feet not four yeah. feet by four feet um so this extra two feet but anyway so it took a while and then once um I kind of like was working with these two paint like I was like okay I've got this thing and I was like I really like the background can I just do the background and I was like you are allowed to just do the background I'm giving you permission right now you can do that uh -huh. and so I did and then I did I started working on the on um, the first super abstract work that I had done besides because I did so the one on top this is the very first one yeah did, that right? one yeah. is was an abstract work that I did while I was working on on the uh, the figurative paintings, and a sight for sore eyes. It's a long time no see. Yeah. Okay. It's um, and I did that painting years ago, and my husband hated it. He was like, "I hate that painting," and I was like, oh. <laughs> "He, you know." And I told, he knows cake. now. He's not allowed to, to be as. Um, because I said, you can't be that judgmental. Anyway, <laughs> I sold that painting, so whatever. That's um, really I funny. loved that painting, but I got really, that really kind of tripped me up for a while where I was like, well, I don't know if that, maybe that's not what I should be doing. And maybe it's too much and maybe blah, blah, whatever. Um, and, I'm sorry, what year was this done? That, I hope. If you remember. remember. So I was working in gouache. I hadn't been, because I was, I also had a lot of spaces where I wasn't allowed, like they wouldn't allow oil painting um, because of the smell and like all oh, that kind I of see. stuff. So I want to say 2011 maybe? 2011. 2012. Okay. Yeah. So that was kind of. That was like a blip. In the, because I did, like I said, like originally I was all abstract, right. and so like all the old abstracts on my on my site are like from ninety eight, ninety seven, yeah, ninety, you know, ninety six, ninety seven, ninety eight, mm -hmm. into ninety nine even. But I was doing, you know, like so. But then once I started doing the figurative work, then I was like kind of all in on the figurative stuff, um, and. Yeah, so there, but then when I was like, you know what, I think this is going to make, this really excites me a lot. And I think I could have, I really think I could just say a lot within this. And then when I started thinking about the, the like, you know, the language stuff and learning language and it kind of all was like coalescing at the same time, like probably, you know, three or four, four, four or five years ago. So, okay. That was kind of the the genesis of of returning back to it, and I feel like I'm I'm definitely happier making this kind of work, and mm. it's more exciting to me. And Fantastic. I feel like I have a little more control. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, because I was doing jewelry for a long time. I was just m doing metalsmith stuff where I was making like these sculptural pieces out of metal and working in silver and brass and copper and making. Um, just sculpting pieces of art 
using metal and i thought mm-hmm. well maybe i'm just maybe i just need to make jewelry and smaller paintings now like it's just jewelry smaller paintings and then acting mm-hmm. and then it was like i can't do jewelry because anyway it just it becomes like throwing things at the wall sometimes because sure. i was like what is interesting to me right now well let's just put this to the side for now yeah. and start doing focusing on this so that you can actually move forward yeah because you have to you do have to focus in order to move forward <laughs> at some point yeah yeah the um, process no i can i can strongly empath- empathize with that more than you know really it's like <laughs> So many ideas, so many opportunities, especially nowadays with the internet and Instagram. I mean, there are so many talented artists and people on Instagram, and I can just go on the Explore page and look at amazing jewelry, amazing paintings, uh, and it's just all so much, and it's great. It's like, I'm sure, you know, pre-internet people like Van Gogh or Picasso would greatly appreciate to be able to have the same access, but at the same (laughs) time, it's like everything, there's a balance. And it's it's one of those things for me. It's it's easy to overdo when it's just like, oh my gosh, yeah. so much beautiful work. Totally. And I also like I'm a big TikTok fan. Mm. Um, and I use I mean I use TikTok more of like as like a education. Like I learn so much on there about history and about I politics and it's funny and people are you know just the enter you know just like people just regular people doing regular things or telling a story or whatever it is and I love those I love the aspect of social media when you can harness it and be like I can this isn't just like me feeling this isn't just gonna make me feel bad it's gonna you know it's gonna inspire me and like that's what to me Instagram is too like it's just like oh my god look at all these amazing people like I yeah so yeah definitely um I just queued up the the Instagram and I'm on your your uh, profile here why don't we start with your profile and just kind of um yeah if there are any like like you can kind of just talk about like what you're up to nowadays okay and i could do it like well yes i guess oh my goodness if there's any particular so... works i know your profile is like it's it's because you're such a you have acting and also art it's yes. kind of a, a mishmash of a variety of things well, but, I have two um, two accounts now, so I have a separate account for acting, which I think was a big step. It was a good idea because I wanted to make sure that this was really about art. Okay. Um, but I do like I'm posting about the show on Saturday, um, photographs of things like this was at the De Young. Like this was a table that I loved. Like I was just like, what a beautiful image. Hmm. Um, and then I do try, I'm trying to do more process stuff, like work, work in process videos and thinking about like how does, I feel like it is interesting to people to see the work as it's being made. Um, Definitely. And then yeah. just trying to also just keep promoting, you know, the, all the other things that I'm working on too. Mm-hmm. Um, are there artworks on your, I believe there are artworks on your Instagram that aren't on your website? I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, cause a lot of these like kind of sketchier thing, like this is like us. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I might have that on the site, but like there's some sketches where I'm like, hmm, I don't think I would sell that, but here, you know, like I would show it. And I try to also put, Photograph like photography that or photographs that I've taken that are really inspiring to me. Mm. Um, I try to take my kids off um, just because they're older now, and uh, I feel like as a protection to them, I don't want them on the internet. But I used to also use it as like a platform as a mom, mom artist. You know. Oh, I see. Like, oh, yeah. Right. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm an artist and and a mother, and it's hard. And it's sure. really, you know harder, especially as they were little. Is this the the early stages of your totally. wheel? Yep. Oh, cool. So that's very very recent. Yep. Twenty twenty two. Yeah, and you can like it's even like this is where I was kind of like working from with these old rugs, these old Middle Eastern rugs. 
because oh, I was. Oh big, right, yeah. it was based off your grand. You had a grandfather who had a, a rug store. A rug store. Yeah. yeah. So is that that's the inspiration for it, huh? Yeah. And this one I had such a hard time with. Oh my god. I could not get this thing to work, and I was like, "What?" Like, it just it tackled me. Because I really didn't know what, I just didn't, there were shapes I didn't like, there were things that were happening in it that I didn't like, and I was like, I am, I'm really struggling with this piece. Hmm. And sometimes you just have to keep working and working and working it. Because I feel like it was, like I, it's funny because I even like it better in this digital form, but like in real life, I was like, whoa, like it's too much. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm so glad it turned out the way it did. But like even... You know, like this painting and this painting, I did, you know, these are all pretty early, like the last couple of years. But I just, I put, I had have them on my site for a couple of years. I like kind of like put them in show, like I would um, enter juried shows with those and I never got anything out of it. And I was like, you know what? I don't, I don't think I like those paintings, actually. I think I need to keep working on them. And, um, yeah, I kind of made that decision to tear it down a little bit. Mm. I really like this one here, too. Thank you. Yeah. That one's The blues. Here. It almost reminds me of, like, an aerial perspective of, like, a pond mm. with all these... And these are, like, droplets hitting it. I love that. Yeah. And all these colors. I think water is a big theme of like of inspiration for me and just like the way it moves and watching it and you know mm -hmm. waves and you know that that flow yeah they they actually he bought two of my paintings we bought that one and wheel oh really mm -hmm. oh same, wow. per, same person which is interesting because they're they're very different they are different. paintings so i love that they have both of them now and i was able to go to the house and drop off painting and I got to see both of them and um and it was it's really cool to see it like in the situation in the, like in the house not to get too art speaky but when you look at this work I'm just curious like what what do you feel mm. it's hard for me to separate myself from it like not no like it satisfies me it, just satisfies, <laughs> it satisfies me as an art like as from making it i'm like that is a that to me balances everything out in my in my mind like i'm like everything looks the way i really am happy that it looks that way and i feel like yeah. to me it's like it's so there's so much depth to it there's texture there's like so many layers and I love that it's like mysterious and um like you feel like you could put your hand in it mm -hmm. you know it's jazz I don't know like there was a paint and I was like this painting is jazz and mm. I don't even listen to that much jazz when I'm working like I love jazz but I'm not like oh I'm a jazz musician like I love jazz I was just like oh this is jazz like it was yeah. the purple one with the flower um and I I ironically it's, I had a show, actually, yeah, it's not even, this isn't even finished. Um, but I had a show at a jazz club in Oakland last summer, and mm -hmm. this one was ha hanging in that show. And one of the guys that worked there bought it. And I was like, that is so funny that you bought this, because that's, I just thought of jazz. And yeah. I was, it was before I even, like, put it in the show. Like, I was like, it's oh, jazz! Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Yep. And you said you had a, a show earlier. Why don't we mention that now? I mean, earlier yeah. as in you, that we have a, one coming up. Yes. I. Um, so there's a couple things happening. I. The show on Saturday is um, is put on by Art Fuse, and the reception is. Oh my God! I hope they put the address on here. <laughs> Uh, on Market Street, 2051 Market Street. Oh, this Friday? Yeah, it's a Saturday. Yeah, you're okay. not going to be dead. It won't be time. released. Okay. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> no, it's all good. Um, It'll be up till May 13th. Oh, it will. Then, oh, yeah. okay. Fantastic. And then, um, but no rush. It's like, but then uh, I'm, I'm in a, I'm in part of a gallery called Gallery 2727, which is in Berkeley. And there we're at 2727 California Street. And I'm going to be doing East Bay Open Studios, which is two weekends in May. Okay. I think. And um, so that'll, the, the work will be up at that gallery. Okay. And then also I just um, got accepted into City Art Gallery in San Francisco. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Thank you. So I'll be ha- like, I just, um, they have lottery system is how you get a show there. So I put myself in the lottery there. So hopefully in the next, year, in the next like six months, I'll be showing there. Cool. Okay. Yeah. I'll be sure to put the, the link, get the link from you and put it in the description awesome. for the, for this video. Thanks. Um, Cool, yeah, and and then were there uh, any underrated artists or friends that you wanted to shout out on Instagram and yes. show off their work? Um, so my friend Catherine Streeter is a wonderful artist. She her Insta, her Instagram is Catherine Streeter, I think. Yeah. So she does these really cool collages. Catherine Streeter. I love her work so much. Oh, wow, that is cool. I'm just going to pull it up here so it's on the screen share. I love her textures and her, she's like just so much. It's funny, it's like wry, it's emotional, it's got so much like. Her, I just love her brain. Like her brain, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like where you could open up somebody's head and be like, wow, what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is cool. And you're my friend. And she's in New York. She is in New York. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's where we met, actually. I mean, look at this. What works speak to you the most? Oh, my God. Oh, I also have coolest. like I have so much of her work too because we um so it's like everywhere in my studio so like she made that doll for me with the two heads and like all of these like pieces this is one of her oh yeah up there yeah mm-hmm. um that one and then she did this And there's more in the house. Like I have tons. I have tons of her work all over the house because we do yeah. a lot of exchange and whatever. I mean, that's the best way to get people's work too. Like, is be having friends who are artists, and then you just do, I don't know, like exchanges and um, barter or whatever. Barter, yeah. I I'll love trade it. you one of mine exactly, for one of yours. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> is it all um, on? Like, uh, what is that? Like six by eight? No, they're, parts? they're all different sizes. They're mostly small though. They're not huge. Um, Interesting. Probably, like maybe, I don't know what, maybe 14 by 11 would be it. She doesn't work huge. Yeah. Um, but she does like, um, yeah, she is, she's so cute. <laughs> um, but she's done like illustration so she'll sometimes do like straight illustration for magazines and for different places npr and new york times and that and yeah. different kind of stuff but then it's very much her own personal work so it's very it's so personal um and emotional and just from the heart and from her like you know just kind of like opening up herself to the page and being like this is how I'm feeling again like this is how I'm feeling or like this is the way like this is where I am right now mm. like I love all the this diff- the different textures of this one too yeah that is really cool I'm just now getting into exploring like the uh, um, for lack of better words like the craft artists mm. who mm-hmm. who um, I consider artists. I mean, they're visual artists, but they yeah. cr- they focus on like on Etsy. They'll be selling postcards or little letters or stickers, even. Totally. Um, yeah. yeah, like designers and stuff like that. Yeah. But um, not to say that that's what she is. But um, I just see the small, the small sizes here, and that's kind of what comes to mind for me. 
But no, these are really cool. Catherine Streeter. Yeah. I see she has beetle blossoms in, in common that I'm already following. Oh, that's funny. I um, love that. I love when you're like, oh, who else is following this person? You know, it's like, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, and then my other friend, um, Kimberly makes, she's an abstract artist as well. Um, but hers is Kiki Schomburg. And she does, like, she is like a master of color. She really understands color and shape and kind of like how, um, and texture. And, and she's really interested in those kind of, that kind of layering. Um, and we also, we all, the three of us met through illustration in New York City. So I was doing illustration as well as graphic design at the time, just trying to find whatever it was that I could, whatever was going to pay my bills or help me pay my bills. So that's how we met. Mm -hmm. And so she's done a lot of graphic design um, work as well. But she's, um, like these, you know, like it, these, in the shapes and the, and the different kind of ways that she's using the canvas mm -hmm. and the space of the canvas and, and these little kind of windows of like, yeah. you know, like emotional, emotional windows. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. And she's based in New York City, but she also lives in Colorado. So I, I saw that, the Rocky Mountains. I, I know, was testing like, I, my geography. I'm like, I thought that was far away. <laughs> You're like, that's not Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like it, it, oops, um, it kind of, like, you can see all the different places in her paintings as well. Like, I feel like that was our, it's a good representation of both. Mm -hmm. But so different, like the three of us. But we'll do, so what we try to do is, like, a couple times a year, I mean, we do, we Zoom like weekly usually and just like talk and catch up but sometimes we'll do kind of like art art zooms where we just like sit and make art together but what we've tried been trying to do in the last couple of years is like actually like pick a place go there meet there and then like you know rent a place and then we'll just hang out and cook food and make make art mm -hmm. together and either experiment with different things or just like hang out together like I love this part mm -hmm. I love that um which I love, and it's just kind of a way to connect and also work together and also push each other and get, you know, make sure that we're, like, accountable for each other, too. Um, you know, like, hey, we got to keep making work. We can't give up on each other, either. You know, yeah. don't stop. Don't stop. Yeah. <laughs> don't really give like, up. I really like that. Yeah. yeah. Do you do artist residencies uh, outside of that at all? Have you ever tried that? I haven't. I haven't. I yeah. thought about... I. I've definitely looked into them and been like very curious about them for sure, but I've never mm -hmm. done them. It's it's funny because I know like Victoria is really good about going. Like she, she does a lot. A lot. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I love that, um, and I love that it changes her work, like the perspective of what she does. You know, so I I um. But no, not yet. Mm. Maybe someday. Yeah. <laughs> um. You went to uh, Drew University in in New Jersey yeah. and studied several things, English primarily, I believe, and then also acting and art. Yeah. Um, your time there and then also I was on your backstage mm -hmm. uh, profile mm -hmm. and looking at some of like the training that you've done with acting. I'm always curious, like, in all in all of that training in different fields if you've taken anything away like any exercise or mm. um i mean yeah really just like an exercise that you feel really helps with your uh creativity um, in the visual art i guess mm. more specifically i guess is there anything in the performing arts that you feel like you use in in your painting that's interesting um probably breath work because uh, performing is so much about n like knowing your voice 
learning your what your voice like you're learning what your voice is and what it sounds like and how to use it but also um how you know how breathing really affects everything that you do Mm -hmm. so i think um i will sometimes have a tendency to paint and clench my jaw Mm. And so there have been times when I've been like, oh, my God, like I'm either overthinking something and like ah, it's all going in my jaw. So I have to like relax. Yeah. So I use definitely levels, layers of that um, in my in this work. And I think I think also just being physical is a very, you know, like I don't like sitting for long periods of time. So I think just being moving around, having a bunch of paintings to work out of like I'm working on couple paintings at a time like this one's Mm -hmm. like obviously in progress yeah um but it's funny because drew was where i ended up but i was i went to like four different schools because i started at boston university they have like a dumb a school for dumb people i'm just kidding okay (laughs) they had this school it was like college they called it the college of basic studies and they were like oh wow we think you have potential Mm-hmm. Well, well, so we'll let you into the school, and if you prove yourself, then we'll we we'll like matriculate you into the real school. Oh, I see. Yeah, um, it's but like a community college type. Well, thing. it would it was within Boston University, so it was like mm-hmm. you still paid their tuition. Mm-hmm. So they were like, "Well, we still want your money." Okay. But <laughs> yeah. We, <laughs> but you're so you're in the school, but you're in this other school where we're giving you more of like a like I don't know because I was a terrible student because okay. I have just wanted to party and do other things mm-hmm. um in high school but i was also but i had potential i did other things i was like in, you know like involved in different groups so i think they saw that yeah. but i ended up there and then you know my parents taught at fairly dickinson university so both of them were university professors mm-hmm. and of course my mom was like this college costs too much money you mm-hmm. need to cut you know like you need to come to fairly dickinson because it's free and i was like yeah. all right fine so I left Boston and went to New Jersey and was at Fairleigh Dickinson for a year. And I was at, but they had a school in England that I went to called Roxton, which was great. And it was a wonderful school. It was a semester long in England and in, in this old abbey that's like about you know two hours outside of London. Mm-hmm. So it was a great experience. And then I got kind of, I was like, I think I really want to focus on acting. Um, and Drew had an acting program, and I was like, oh, I should probably maybe move over there mm-hmm. um, and do their acting program. Um, but again, you know, my mom was the, the whatever you want to call her. She, you know, she had a lot of opinions, and I did not have the sense of self to say, those are your opinions, and I'm going to do whatever I'm going to do anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was like, you cannot, you can't, have an, you can't do an acting degree and mm-hmm. you can't do an art degree so you just have to stay at Drew but do a, you know your English degree mm-hmm. so that really ham- hampered a lot of the stuff that I wanted to do where I was like right. I couldn't do acting at Drew fully because they wouldn't you know if you're not major or whatever so I think that really affected kind of how I moved around in the world too because I was like well, I don't I don't know yeah. what you know but so college was confusing and then post-college was also confusing because I felt like I got some you know I went I was at taking classes at school of visual arts for graphic design and illustration and also Mm -hmm. the painting workshops and then I was trying to just do like acting whatever I could do jobs that I could pick up um Mm -hmm. films small films or like dip my toe into whatever try and just do Whatever I could do there. So I, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. kind of what led me to that. Like those schools, you know, it wasn't like I was like, well, I had to go to Drew, you know. Right. I see. <laughs> I see. Breath. Yeah, but no, so, so breath work, that's interesting. Mm. Um, any, can you kind of talk more about that? Like, mm. like what kind of, was there a specific kind of breath work or, and how, and how does that help you? Um, yeah, it's, I'm trying to think of kind of like where, like with the, you know, like where, I mean, it's like in acting, you have to learn how to use your voice well in order to project and get mm-hmm. your chest up, be, be heard or whatever it is. 
um, in a way that, that people can understand or understand what you're saying, yeah. even if you're being quiet or whatever it is. And that was, that was always a really, cha- really huge challenge for me, mm-hmm. being from where I was, came from, and not having a voice. And also feeling like I never could use my voice. So it was like that kind of like, um, you know, coming from there uh, and then never fully having the training, especially probably at a younger age. I think the earlier you can start it, the better. You know what I mean? Like where mm-hmm. it's like, like what you're saying with public speaking or that those classes where they're kind of like, don't forget to breathe. You know, yeah. and like, oh, oh, I am not. I mean, of course, we're always breathing. Yeah. But if you really stop and 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 say, well, where am I breathing and how am I breathing? And, mm-hmm. um, so I took a lot of voice classes with different people, or or even just like one on one. Yeah. And it, it's always hard to find the right person who's going to really unlock, help you really unlock that part of you where you're like, oh, I understand now how to take a breath while I'm talking or even Mm -hmm. to just pay attention to where it is in my body and, and the kind of, and then, but it's so much about physical, the physical body as well. So learning how to do like movement. And I would take, I was taking a lot of dance classes Mm -hmm. where again, like you, you're, once you start linking the breath to movement, you're more in grounded in your feet. And that was another like, big deal for me that um took a really long time which was just being grounded in my feet and feeling both feet on the ground and um i i mean i hate to it's like it sounds so weirdly cliche but it really was like i turned 40 and i was like okay (laughs) i gotta Mm. figure all this stuff out or i'm just gonna be like a mess Mm. so i felt like that and i think that was also about the same time that my mom kind of like her hold was released because of her brain Mm -hmm. and so I think a lot of that kind of came you know later in life for me where I feel like it it's much more of a struggle for me to figure like to remind myself I'm I feel like I'm constantly working on it because yeah I'm not used to it and it is very Mm. hard yeah Um, but I think singing I took I've done some singing lessons with a coach and mm-hmm. she taught me a lot about breath and paying yeah. attention to the breath and um tiktok there's <laughs> a lot of people on tiktok that talk about breath and like how to find your breath and find that place in your body where it's like oh this is where i'm speaking authentically from myself yeah you know mm-hmm. that makes sense Vers- no it does yeah versus like nasal breathing mm-hmm. which is like yeah i i can when i get nervous i also can have a very airy voice um like job interviews or anytime i'm being judged like kind of on the spot in like a good way like people are rightfully so like trying to get a feel for who i am and stuff but like i i feel my my voice coming up here totally. and i i totally even as you were saying it i was like thinking oh yeah breathe into my stomach or whatever totally, totally. And I think um, the, just even the awareness is step one. And then it's yeah. like anytime you're like an emotional or somebody like is like trying to talk to you about how they're feeling or their emotions or something mm-hmm. bothering them. And you're like, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, whatever that is. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So is it so when you're you're doing your art, you might have uncomfortable emotions and then that. Or, or resistance to doing art, which a lot of artists experience, mm-hmm. myself included. Yeah. Uh, and then you're just able to notice that and then kind of breathe and reconnect with your breath. Is yeah. that the idea? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I think I did yoga for a long time as well. Like I was just constantly, I'm constantly searching for, I think, just getting more into my body, just being mm-hmm. more grounded in myself. So I think yoga was helpful for a while. That kind of breathing was helpful for a while. Um, dance was helpful for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, any kind of physical, like, con- like I feel like I'm constantly taking classes and taking workshops and working yeah. with people, and I, I got, I get very impatient with myself because I do feel like, God, I'm tired of being on the, on the student end of things. But I think it does, it keeps you so supple in a way. Like I'm just mm-hmm. always in awe. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, wow, mm-hmm. <laughs> neat. I'm always yeah. learning, like, like, I don't know. 
<laughs> I think that's good. I think it's healthy oh, to, to be learning. Um, okay, let's see here. Living in insecurity. Hmm? <laughs> Living Loving in insecurity. Constantly oh. insecure, yeah. Yeah. Hmm, you and I are a lot alike in that way, then. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just, I, I don't you know. I mean, I think you, you have to kind of find the way where you're like, I think this is a good thing. It's mm. kind of, you know, something something is good about that. But I think I see, when I see people who really are good at stuff, and they're not even able to do the things that they should be doing, it always, it always makes me sad. Because I'm like, God, you're... You're so good at this thing, and you're not even able to do it. You know, either mm -hmm. because of money barrier, or because of where you are, or with timing, or whatever it is. So, mm -hmm. I um, I, I feel a little bit like an imposter, and again, like I feel like everybody deals with imposter syndrome. But, mm -hmm. you know, how do you deal with that? Because it's not like you have you have this imposter syndrome and it's stopping you. Because you are a, an actor <laughs> oh, no. and you are making paintings. Um, I just keep fooling people. <laughs> you keep fooling them. <laughs> I'm really good at whatever that is. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I because I really am like I'm really just like uh, tomorrow. I'm I'm gonna stop. Tomorrow I'm done. I just gonna sit on my butt. I'm gonna start drinking again. And I'm gonna <laughs> like I'm just gonna get whatever yeah. and i'm just gonna st this is not worth it this is all this discomfort is not worth it for mm -hmm. like whatever and then i get up the next day and like i'll have an email from someone i'll be like by the way we want to cast you in this whatever or mm -hmm. i'll be like oh oh i did put my work in that show and they want it or or whatever it is and like something's always coming and i think there's there's something about that mm -hmm. i don't know if that's an adhd brain or whatever it is where it's like that constant like um wanting the dopamine or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> you're like Ooh, what's happening today it's gonna be something new yeah i'm so excited to see what's gonna happen yeah but then at the same time i'm like nothing new is gonna happen so i'm gonna be a nothing mm -hmm. and that's so much easier so much easier to be a nothing mm. because then there's no challenge then you're not challenging yourself and you don't have to worry about it yeah I think a lot of people, more more people than you might think, might resonate with that. I hope um, so. <laughs> yeah. We're like this lady who interviews a mess. Um, with your background in in uh, in traveling mm. and and your your ties to uh, Armenia and and. Israel and and I'm sure you've traveled to other places. Technically, I'm, I'm, it's Turkey actually. My family's from Turkey, not Armenia. Oh, it's Turkey. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know it's hard. It's not. It's not. Um, it's part of the gen like what happened with the genocide, which is where my parents, right. my grandparents survived that. But they were actually in Turkey, and what is now Armenia is it's part of kind of it was part of the soviet union for when the soviet union was soviet union so mm -hmm. it's a different place and they even speak a different completely different dialect of armenian so even the dialect of armenian that i'm learning is the diaspora version of that language not even the pure version right. that was spoken. well you could call it pure but it like to to the people who are in the diaspora it's the reason they spoke it because they were the armenians of turkey mm -hmm. as opposed to the armenians of where is now Armenia. Yeah. So that's where it gets like a little bit like it's it's a silly delineation, but to me I still like go, well, technically I am from Turkey. Okay. And I and the Turkish government does not want to hasn't recognized the genocide and they refuse to re recognize it. So I think mm -hmm. there's a little bit of a political act of going, well, I, I'm yeah. putting my foot in, you know, like you may have taken away all this land and you may have taken the people and murdered them and mm -hmm. whatever, but we do still belong there. Like, that is where we're from. And even when mm -hmm. I did 23andMe, it was like, you're from Turkey. And I was like, I know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, this is where you're from. I'm like, I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, not to uh, switch topics real quick, but and, and this is a small 
very small podcast. We're just getting started, but I do want to give you the space if there's anything you, else you want to add to that, because mm. I know that was part of your a big part of your bio was the importance of uh, your history and stuff and yeah. feeling like that land was taken and all the awful things that happened there, yeah. which to be completely honest, I'm not, I don't know a lot about it as someone. Not many people. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah. Is there anything else that you want to add? I mean, I think it's just kind of the knowing that speaking about out about these things is really important. And I think learning the history, like where I kind of turn my gaze is like, well, now I'm in America and what happened in America and how did, how did we get here and who shaped America and how did we get, you know, like Mm -hmm. in the African American experience and, you know, black, the way that we have exploited black lives in order to have the country that we have Mm -hmm. to me is, is a very big part of like it's very important to me to pay attention to that and to pay attention to like well this was the land of opportunity but how did we get to this land of opportunity like and my grandparents came here and they were they it was hard for them but it wasn't like they still were able to make it you know right yeah and being middle eastern was a crutch but it wasn't so much of a crutch that my grandfather couldn't buy a house in queens you know, and have mm-hmm. a store and do, you know, like he still had to work, work really hard and, you know, whatever, the, all those things. But, um, and then to look at like the Native American genocide and to call it a genocide and, you know, mm-hmm. and the, the way that we are taught history about America and, yeah. and the way that they teach the history in Turkey where like they don't talk about yeah. what happened to the Armenians at all. And people know about it. Because mm-hmm. their grandparents were like, mm, yeah, we, that may have happened. Or yeah. your grandmother's actually Armenian, but she converted to, you know, she, she hid in order to be able to stay in the country. Or she was, you know, basically just taken by a Turkish guy who was like, this lady's pretty, I'm going to marry her. You know, mm-hmm. and so it's kind of like all these these stories that, that people keep wanting to say, well, that, you know, we don't need to keep bringing that up. It's, it's uncomfortable for people to talk about or it, or, you know, they don't want to talk about that anymore. It makes people uncomfortable. It's like, yeah, that's exactly where we need to be. We need to be mm-hmm. having these uncomfortable conversations about what happened and, and hear it and hear about how, you know, towns were made. And even the town I'm living in right now is Piedmont is like, um, you know, there are people who's, houses who literally on the deed of their house it says do not sell to you know jews or black people you know what i mean like in the deed like that's how racist people were Mm -hmm. so i just i think that it is really important to just know where you come from and then stand up for the people who who are also who whose stories are also being suppressed i think that's where it manifests for me too not only just in my work of saying like and where do we all belong in the world you know I could see how how your uh, that how you, why why you empathize with the the Native American and rightfully so, but na- with that situation so much. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember in elementary school being taught about that, and it. I can reflect on it now and be like, it wasn't, it wasn't objective. Like the point of school is to be ob- ob- objectively learning knowledge about the world. And it definitely had a slant towards... Totally. uh, And I remember, like, even... um, Like, I went to the Oakland Museum, and they have pretty amazing, you know, kind of different displays of, like, history there, of the history of California, even. And, like, Mm -hmm. just, like, by the time people got to California, they were just flat out murdering people you know what i mean like they were just like and Mm -hmm. i feel like we were taught like there weren't that many of them you know Mm -hmm. what i mean like there weren't that many native americans in america i feel like that's what i that's where in my you know my brain i'm like that's i feel like that's what i was taught yeah they were just like the land was open and i was like that is not what was happening yeah (laughs) the thing the thing that i remember uh, the most was was being disturbed by like the short changing of the deals that were made um of of like yeah um native americans not i learned about this later like in college but like 
Native Americans not really having a conceptual understanding of like owning land yeah. and how they unknowingly like essentially like sold rip, signed contracts that gave the land to like uh, you know European settlers Americans that were using their own systems and laws to to take this land exactly. so um and like there's yeah, like an really... intelligence versus like you know and I'm like there's not it's like there's no one kind of intelligence either like yeah. they didn't you know it's like it's just it's so fascinating the more I learn the the more I learn the less I know and the and that makes like I'm so I'm so glad about that like I'm like oh well, that just means I need to learn no more and be more shocked <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. and be more disturbed like even i don't know yeah i could go on and on <laughs> <laughs> well that's, yeah i wanted to give you that space because it's important and like as i was preparing for this interview i'm like oh man like i i really will after this interview uh, be looking into just out of curiosity's sake mm -hmm. honestly and i think it is important to know about the the geno genocides of was it the 20th century yeah like so 19? 1915 1915 yeah, 15, 16 yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so my, um, yeah, and my grandfather and grandmother were both survivors. Um, and, you know, they lost m many members of their family. My grandpa, my grandmother's father was murdered by, you know, and then because he was a certain level in, you know, in society, like that's why, you know, they were like, well, we'll take out all the intellectuals and people working in these jobs and then we'll work down from there and just weaken that part of that whatever so it's it's so interesting to also think about how my dad processed that and the trauma of my grandfather's experience and then my grandfather kind of you know my dad being like oh, i don't want i don't want anything to do with that like that's not my path you know mm -hmm. um i'm gonna do something else and i'm not speaking the language and i love you guys but I can't like I don't want to be reminded of all that. Yeah, and I think I could understand yeah, that. Yeah, and it's like he's still there's some shame in it, and I think America makes you feel ashamed to be from anywhere else unless, you know, and like just be American is like kind of that thing, and I think there's that shame passed on to me in the sense of like where I was like, well, I can't be ethnic, like don't you know. I wish yeah. I ate bologna sandwiches, you know, that kind of bullshit where you're like, uh -huh. what? White bread. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. I wish I didn't. I wish I ate white bread. You're like, uh, what? Instead of these, whatever. Now I'm like, oh, God. So much sugar in white bread. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> exactly. Or whatever. Yeah. That's a whole nother topic of, yeah, yeah. I really dislike the standard American diet that exactly. we have as our culture. Exactly. But, um, and the thing that, like, you know, like, or lunchables or you know, somebody was saying that anyway. so yeah it's it's a it's a very it it's there's so much there's a very rich interesting story in all of that where you're you know you're kind of just like oh let's let's dig a little deeper here you know why why do you feel this way or why you know mm -hmm. even just like um and i lo like i love my husband but i know that i I, you know, he is, he looks Irish, you know, he's like a tall, handsome, red, red head, but like dirty blonde, blue eyes, you know, and I was like, ooh, I, you know, I think this is where I belong, you know what I mean, I belong, I should, I should hide my children with the white people, you know, I <laughs> you see. know what I mean, yeah. like where I would, you know, like I, I didn't like seek out an Armenian man, because I was, or a Jewish man, because I was like, oh, I don't know, should I be hiding? Should I hide myself? Because yeah. the Nazis might find us or the Turks might find us. And like, that's a big part of my brain, which is like, not to, like, it was not, ha it wasn't happening. So I don't, you know, there's yeah. that weird kind of fear, fear processing always in my head. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's so, that's so interesting. And it's not, <laughs> yeah, it's hard to relate to for me, but yeah. I could see, yeah. Even growing up in New York where, like, I feel like I, um, you know, like, you wouldn't park your car on the street and then open your trunk and pull, or put a bag in your trunk and then close the trunk and walk away from your car. Like, you never do that. Because mm -hmm. it would get breaking, it broken into. It would get Yeah. My husband does that all the time. Like, he'll try and do that all the time. And I'm like, D do not. Yeah. Ever. 
I mean, he'll be like, we're not in a scare. I'm like, we don't, you cannot do that ever, 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 ever. Yeah. <laughs> no. So it's just a fun, those funny moments of like, where I'm just like, high alert. Who's, mm-hmm. you know, where's, who's coming? What's coming? Is somebody coming? You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, I think that's part maybe also from just being in the being in the city, having that like hardwired from a young it's age true. too. Yeah, it's true. I mean, yeah. in New Jersey, we were in the, in the suburbs of New Jersey. Oh, you were. Yeah. So oh. it was like well, then... we were in, but we spent a lot of time in New York City. So I always say it both, which I think mm-hmm. most people from when you meet somebody from New Jersey, they're like, I grew up in New Jersey and New York. Because they're really close, right? <laughs> they're super close. Yeah, you know, like a half an hour drive. Yeah. Yeah. And plus, my um, mom was like. A full like she she always wanted to be seen as a New Yorker because she grew up in New York and so oh, okay. for her it was like a very big deal like she just lived in New Jersey okay <laughs> she was really from Brooklyn <laughs> gotcha for myself and and anyone who listens or listens in the future who's curious so from a, from a from a I don't want to say a direct source, but someone who's connected to that history. Is there uh, anything besides like Wikipedia for learning about the uh, Armenian genocide? Oh, gosh. Um, it's interesting. There are books and there there's a lot of Armenian groups and like there's like the AGBU was like the Armenian General Benevolent Association, whatever. Um, but mostly there's stuff online if you just kind of like do a little search. And if you yeah, go, sure. like, if you look at like, um, there's a band called System of a Down mm-hmm. and they're all Armenians mm. and, um, Serge Tankian is the lead singer and he has talked about it in the, like in interviews and, and podcasts and stuff like that. But, um, so there, there's like ways to find out about it outside of just yeah like but i think a good search should bring up everything yeah (laughs) yeah um cool well we're kind of getting towards the end the the questions towards the end are a bit more like broad and you could kind of connect them to to art if you'd like some of them towards the end are are back to art but um this one's a bit more open-ended which is just like uh what's What's an uncommon experience which was so positive for you that it makes you sad to like know that most people will not have that experience? It's a bit of a mouthful. No, it's good. It's okay. good. It gave me a pause. Um, I I think I spent such an enormous amount of time alone growing up, even though I'm, I'm the youngest of four siblings, um, because of the age, there's a huge, there's big age gap. Um, and I feel like because I spent so much time alone, I have a really weird life perspective. Like it's just weird. Like I'm a little weird, Hmm. which is, which I, I think people don't lean into their weirdness enough. Like, I think they think a lot about how people, they think about what other people think too much. So I think that's like, if I could say like, ooh, if you could encourage yourself to do something, it's like, just be more weird. (laughs) Be more authentically weird to yourself. To yourself. Yeah. Like, not like just weird. Yeah. Yeah. But like, I don't know. I, um... And I even wrote, I think I wrote myself a note that was like, make it weird. And just like, if you're feeling like you're getting a little too technical or or the patterning is getting a little too perfectly patterned, where it's like, oh, it's feeling like this just is too comfortable in itself. Then I'm Mm -hmm. like, you got to do something. We got to like put something on top of it or paint something over or grab some red and do something different because it's too... It's looking too, not perfect. I don't know what, and I was going to say normal, but that's not it either. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. That was what, that's where I went. Okay. Keep it weird. Yeah. 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 Keeping it weird. Mm-hmm. 
do you feel like you've seen a lot of people um, kind of going back to what you're saying when you see people who have a strength in a certain area, but they're not expressing that mm-hmm. strength? Do you feel like you've run into people who you see like an authentically weird aspect of them, but then they kind of don't express that yeah. all the yeah. time? Yeah. It's kind of like a side of themselves that. Yeah. And I always like, I'm always so happy when I can like dig into somebody and be like, I see you're weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or like you get that aspect. Like they, there's an aspect of people where there's the front, there's the person that they are, that they show you. And then all mm-hmm. of a sudden they're like, oh man, I just, I don't know. Like they just say something that you're like, that's, that's what I want to hear about. I want to hear about that part of you. I don't really yeah. care. I don't care if your life, I don't, I don't know, like, if it's too, it's, again, it probably goes back to, like, that whole thing of, like, wanting to be around people who are similar to me, I guess, or at mm-hmm. least, like, I don't know, maybe that's, like, but, like, knowing that, like, they have these aspects of their personality that they don't always want to show people, and you're like, that's kind of the most interesting part. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. That was a great answer. Um, what's everything that an artist should try, or sorry, what is something, not everything, what is something that every artist should try at least once? A cat. I'm just kidding. Um, what's, okay, what should an artist try at least once? I think, I think, uh, like taking classes and like, or like taking workshops or like doing something that's like, out, like if you're like oh, a fiber artist, like take a painting class. Or if you're a, um, a painter, like s- try and do something different. Like it's because it, I think it really does mix your brain up to like get your, get yourself to look at it from a different perspective or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do really believe in like just keep pushing yourself to be inspired by all different kinds of things, mm-hmm. whether it be like I don't know, like a thrift store shopping, like something simple where it's like you're not going into a store that you know, yeah. or not, not everything in that store is different and it's different all the time. So every mm-hmm. time you walk in there, it's going to be something different. They're not yeah. going to be like here are the red shirts that. I know are made by this company and I know they're, they're going to fit like this. It's like, I don't mm-hmm. know, go try and find something else that you, whatever. Yeah. Um, so I, I do think it's just kind of like being in the state of, of awe and curiosity mm-hmm. all the time. I think that's the gift that keeps on giving. If mm-hmm. I say one thing to my kids all the time, it's just be curious. Mm-hmm. Just be curious. Don't worry about looking stupid just be curious about it you know how does mm-hmm. it sound how does it feel how does it, whatever and right now i just annoy them with that kind of stuff <laughs> <laughs> like, i want to but yeah i think that's what i would say just be be curious okay what is an uncommon tool that you use in your art practice mm. that you use on a consistent basis that would be hard to live without at this point there's i'm doing less like experimenting with like i love like i'm doing using mostly like you know just like regular tools like brushes and whatever um but i used to use i used to love medical gauze all i used to use medical gauze in like all of my paintings oh really yeah Oh, and wow. I would stretch it across and it would be like, a, like it would, and then I could use it as like a pat, like with the paint and patterning it, like, mm-hmm. and building up on it. And so I loved having that aspect of it, especially in like, if I was doing the, f- the female figures in their dresses and stuff. Yeah. Um, and building and using string, like just like I would pull um, canvases apart and just pull the string mm. and then use that. Um, that is less interesting to me with these. Like, I don't think that works with these at all, but that's what I thought of. Um, but for these, it's mostly like, I find 
that I um, that I really just enjoy the canvas. But again, like the thing I was going to say about canvas and money and 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 opening up myself to working on canvas again in large format was um, Michael's art store has like they have these crazy sales and there's beautifully gallery wrapped canvases mm -hmm. and they are so inexpensive and it, that's my plug for today because <laughs> <laughs> it literally like expanded my practice like to like infinite levels where like yeah. now I don't stress out about buying canvas at all mm -hmm. because it's so cheap and mm -hmm. it's so like that they do these sales where it's like four canvases for the price of two you know or, or whatever like mm -hmm. and so it's made it so that I just can make and be experimental without worrying about money and worrying mm -hmm. about buying supplies so I think that's been like certainly not an uncommon object but I think it's like when you can find these things that you want to really like then it's you're able to experiment more often so i think also mm -hmm. places like east bay um uh what is it the depot i don't know whatever they call it creative reuse oh yeah they have a lot they have canvases that you can that people have painted on that you can buy there too so it's like finding places where you can find materials also that you haven't you know, right like, so yeah to make it yeah but, no that's yeah. great that totally makes sense <laughs> medical cause okay if you could choose one piece of art for humanity to spend with mm. in a room for an hour and I'm going to make a slight change to the question mm. since you are also an actor. Mm. It could also be uh, oh. a play. Oh, a play. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay, that made it harder. Or a movie. Okay. Um, so aside from like, like whatever the politics of the people or whatever, um, the painter who kind of like made, made me understand paint was Clifford Still. And he has a way of taking up space and using a canvas and using paint in a way that I, I just, I find absolutely like mind blowing. So, and there's tons of, I mean, I love painters. I love going to museums. I love, like I can stand in front of so many, I mean, there's so many artists I can name, mm -hmm. but his name comes up first. Mm, Clifford um, Still, S-T-I-L-L. Yes, and it's Clifford with a Y, C-L-Y. Oh, interesting, okay. Um, yeah, and he, uh, the th I mean, he was just like such a, you know, such a big, he had such a big ego as well, so I, you know, because he was like, my paintings cannot be in any museum unless they're all in their own room. So he oh, has wow. to have Was he relatively famous? famous? I'm still learning about Art pretty, history. Yeah. I mean, he was a pretty big abstract expressionist guy. I guess okay. you would call it. I think that's what his, you would put him in. Um, and I don't know a lot about him, actually. In fact, I, I'm i trying to, like, not learn too much because I feel like the more you learn, you're like, oh, this guy's a fucking asshole. And I don't want to learn sure about him. sure he was an asshole. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Pollock was an asshole, and but his work is so interesting. Um, and, like, all the, like, I love, but I also, like, I love pre-Raphaelite work and like that kind of like be those beautiful like lyrical paintings with like of like women and flowers and you know and I love um you know and the uh, the other one is Klimt Gustav Klimt mm -hmm. who to me is like I you know people do say his name when they look at my painting sometimes and I, that makes me extremely happy so mm. he's another one uh, also probably a little problematic um he so I'll stop there for painting in terms of film I um, I don't know I don't know I have yeah. I have um, I think I fall I fall in love with people 
or the way things look as opposed to like a full like where I'm like oh this movie was amazing or whatever mm -hmm. but um but I find books really inspiring too so it's like all those things I can mix together she's been like I have these jars of of like shells and stuff and she's been like picking up each shell and like taking it in her mouth and like walking around <laughs> <laughs> Where's all this stuff going? <laughs> She's like squirreling it away. Oh my gosh. She's really cute. Um, yep. So yeah, I would have to say that my Clifford still was what came to mind. But then mm. there's so many you know, just so many great, amazing artists. Yeah. Thank God. And just to wrap up, final question, uh hypothetical for you, let's say like some point in the future like say a hundred years in the future you have a mother teaching her her son or daughter about about art in an mm. art history book and your name is is in the book and and some of your paintings pop up there what would be most satisfying for you to have as a as a description for your, yourself and your art mm. I think it goes back to probably curiosity and like trying a bunch of stuff like try try like I don't because I I'm I, even the question is like I'm like oh, I don't think I would be in a book so like that's where I go like my brain's like well you wouldn't be in a book anyway and I'm like what is this <laughs> so it's like I that kind of like I feel like I um <laughs> that's my yeah she doesn't understand the canvases I feel like I um I would hope that they would be like she was she was the most she was a curious person so I hope that you're as curious as this person. Mm -hmm. Which doesn't really answer the question. No, it does. Um, you are you are about a major purpose of your your art is to express curiosity, yeah. inspire curiosity. Yeah, and keep pushing that mm -hmm. awe. Awe. She was in awe. Mm. She was in awe all the time. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, with some of your works, like, I mean, some of your photographs here, mm -hmm. just all in, of the natural world, and, yeah, yeah. amazing how a little uh, mindset shift can really make the world into, like, a, a huge art gallery. Yeah, like this. exactly, exactly. Um, great, well, uh, Emily, thank you so much again for, for taking the time for the, oh my God. to have this interview conversation. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for yeah. your great questions and your thoughtful responses too. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And for those listening, uh, uh, where can they connect with you online in your okay. upcoming shows as well? I'm at, so my website for art is devildoll.com and, um, I usually try and put all my shows up there and places you can find me and all my socials. Um, I'm on Instagram at the Devil Doll. I'm on TikTok at the Devil Dolly with an I, and um, I'm on Facebook where, where, uh, under my name Emily Kaishian, and then uh, my acting website is emilykaishian.com. If that interests people, and then I'm on Instagram as an actor under my name Emily Kaishian. Great. Cool. And then if people want to find out about your show, um, you'll be able to share a link with me about that, and I can put that in the description. Yes. Cool. Yes. And the galleries and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. That was awesome.